Hey guys, welcome to my full interview with Grandmaster Vic Moore. He's going to talk about all kinds of amazing stuff, how he came up in the world of karate, the whole thing with Bruce Lee, you probably heard those stories, how he became an honorary made man in the mob, how he taught a chimpanzee karate, and, and so much more. Broken up in the chapters. Hope you guys enjoy it. If you do, consider hitting that like button, subscribing to the channel, commenting below. That helps the engagement and be part of the discussion. And then one last thing, I've recently started a Patreon page, which is linked in the description below if you want to help further support the Viking Samurai and all of my efforts creating this channel and this content for you guys. It'd be greatly appreciated. And of course, you will get some exclusive stuff you can only get there. My name is Grandmaster Victor Moore. I became the first black Grand National Champion in the world. It's a real honor to get you on the show, Grandmaster Moore. You're such a historical and important figure in the martial arts community. And I'm really excited yes. to hear your story, as I know the audience would be too. So starting with your history of how you even got involved with the arts. Oh, yes. Well, as a little young kid, uh, uh, been around seven years of age, there was gentlemen from the military that was teaching a few of us in the backyard because we didn't have karate schools back then. This is back in 1950, you know. And uh, they were showing us a few moves here and there. And then around uh, 50, 51, there was Yamaguchi. He was visiting here and he was uh, doing some katas. That's the forms. Mm -hmm. And I was very impressed with it. And after, oh, another couple of years, there was a gentleman in my community that was up on the hill and all. And I saw him doing some of the same moves. And I thought I knew something. So I went up the hill there and said, oh, I know some of this uh, karate stuff. That was uh, Ron Williams was my first teacher there. And he said, oh, oh, you do? I said, yeah, I know I know some of that stuff. And uh, he had grabbed me by the arm, you know, positioning me, you know, turning around and this and that, looking me over. I said, hey, what are you doing? He said, I'm seeing if you're big enough, strong enough to take some of this karate. I said, yes. I've been doing some of that uh, karate stuff. He shoved me and knocked me down. He thought I was going to be crying. <laughs> I got up, shaking it off, looking at him, you know. I said, you shoved me down. He said, well, yes, you see. If you want to learn this karate stuff, you got to always be ready. You never know when a person's going to attack you. I said, oh, he got ready to move me again. <laughs> and I blocked his arm, almost broke it, you know, hit it as hard as I could. Wow. He said, ouch, oh, boy, what are you doing? You're trying to hurt me. Uh, I, I said, well, you should have blocked it. He said, I wasn't ready. I said, see, you got to always be ready. And he started laughing. He said, kid, you might be all right, you know. And he did. He started teaching me. And we were outside in the woods, and he had me hitting trees jumping up, kicking at trees. He was throwing me around. He was punching and blocking. He was making me tough. I go home with bruises. My mom would say, what's all those bruises on you, boy? That man up there beating on you, you're going to quit that stuff. I said, oh, no, mom. It's, we're just practicing, and, 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 and we hit each other kind of hard. Boy, you crazy. You let that man beat on you like that with these bruises and all. But every day after school, I would go up the hill, start learning those techniques, stances. Get down lower. Get down lower. Blocking. Back in the days, we actually hit each other arms on the block. We're blocking and, and arms are hitting and we low blocking. And we hitting each other in the gut, you know. And, oh, my God. He was trying to get me to quit, but I wouldn't quit. Mm. So that was my first little beginning. That was back in the uh, 50s. Wow. And I stayed with it every day, 
every day. So you so were that, just training was, with him by yourself, though. He didn't have any other students at that time, did he? Oh, well, eventually his brother came in, who was a little younger, more or less my age, you know. And he was our, uh, my wor working partner, you know, so he, he did have us too. But no, wasn't a school, wasn't a bunch of students and all. And later, uh, in the years, there was uh, Bill Dimitri and Ray Hughes. They came to uh, Cincinnati. And in the back of the judo school was where we practiced at. There was no karate schools available, and we had this judo school that had opened up. And I knew a little judo from previous training, and I had to stop at the door, take my shoes off, and bow because Ryan Williams had done taught us all of that, even though there were no schools, but even to go into the grounds where we worked at, we had to remove our shoes and bow and do all the formalities. And the judo instructor, he looked at me, and I'm in this all-white school. Blacks didn't go uptown, Cincinnati. Well, all the students are turning and looking at me. This is weird. He says, uh, hmm, come on in, boy. I said, yes, sir. He says, You've done some martial arts, haven't you? I said, yes, sir. He said, I see you uh, took your shoes off and you bowed coming in. Uh, what can we do for you? I said, well, i like to learn. So he let me uh, learn the uh, judo techniques, you know, teaching me in the classes. And I was the uki, where everybody <laughs> took a turn throwing me around. Mm -hmm. Now, Bill Dimitri and uh, Harvey Eubanks, they came into the judo school and asked, uh, we're karate instructors and we want to know if we can work out in your back room there. And Ray Hughes, the judo instructor, thought about it. You know, he says, uh, well, okay. I had already been doing some of this karate stuff. Mm -hmm. And after the judo lessons, I asked the instructors, hey, can I do some of this karate with y'all? Well, we don't, we don't know, boy. We have to see. Next judo class, come back. They were in there in the back room straightening up. I asked uh, Ray Hughes if I could learn some of that karate back there. He said, well, you have to go back there and ask them, which I did. I went on back and asked them, uh, hey, I'd like to learn some of this karate. I already know some, you know. Mm -hmm. And I'm still working out with... Uh, Ron Williams teaching me every day, getting down in stances, on punches and blocks, hitting trees, hitting each other. And they finally tell me, yes, okay. So now I got more or less, say, two instructors or three instructors because Harvey Eubanks was teaching Goju Karate. He was kind of leading the program and he started teaching. And I was in the room, so I was able to do some of this uh, go to Ru karate. Mm -hmm. And the school finally, you know, broke up and uh, Bill Dimitri took over. So he was teaching uh, Shotokan karate. Very little difference in all of these styles and techniques anyway. And uh, he started off and he was teaching very strict and very hard. And back in the days, David, it seems as if they wanted to get you to quit. You know, everything was, you know, just, we're going to beat the stew out of you. And we're going to make you quit, boy, you know. I just hung in there, hung in there. Now the other uh, karate guys that came in, they, they were taking it as well, too. Several of them was quitting. And we're doing fingertip push-up, knuckle push-up. Back of the wrist push up. We're getting down in stances, way down in low stances, staying down in there till we drop over, you know. And, you know, when I go home, my mama asks me, What am I doing? You know, why am I so tired? And, uh, well, back then, we just had to take a get down in stances and all. Mm -hmm. Boy, you, what are you doing? He's, 
people are taking advantage of you. They're just beating on you and got you all wrapped up in this uh, jujitsu stuff, you know. So uh, Bill Dimitri kept working with me, and eventually he went to uh, Japan again. Now, they had been learning karate overseas, all of these instructors had. Mm -hmm. And they uh, started teaching in their neighborhoods, in the back room and whatnot. And anybody that was learning karate back in the 50s, they'll tell you that's, that's how they got started. That's how they had to learn karate because we didn't have karate schools. There was a few judo schools open up. There was a few Orientals that had clothing stores or uh, grocery stores, and they may would teach somebody in the back room and all, but that was about the extent of it. Then the Matrix, he'd come back and he had to change the style. Well, first he was uh, teaching Kempo, then he went to Japan and come back and he's teaching Shotokan. He's going up to Canada uh, with uh, Soroka, Master Soroka up there, bless his heart. And uh, I got pretty efficient, you know. Uh, I was able to uh, fight. They was teaching uh, the peon kadas, or peon as you want to call it. And the beginners would learn number one. If you got a little more experience, you would learn number two. And then you would move on up to number three. And then you had to be in the brown belt and black belt division to learn the four and five. Mm -hmm. But you practice that one kata over and over for months and months, and you was proficient with it. But you also had to do the moves of the form against an opponent to show that you actually knew the technique. So we had to block the kicks, and they would try and kick you. It wasn't faking, it wasn't pulling punches. We're gonna kick your guts out, as to say. And boy, they throw those kicks at each other and we had to block it and all. And punching the same way, we had to block. We're gonna hit you here. We're gonna hit you there. And if you didn't block it, you got knocked down. You, you got the student knocked out of you. Mm -hmm. So that's the way the training was everywhere. And I had looked around trying to find diff different karate schools, but throughout the Ohio, there was none. And that was the way it was back in the days. So Harvey Eubanks and then Bill Dimitri. Then we had a Chinese fellow that came to the school as an exchange student from the university a Cincinnati engineering uh, department. And he asked if he can teach some classes. Bill Dimitrick, Sensei, well, yes, I, I guess so, I don't care. What they, what in the world did he say that for? That man would have bamboo sticks, he would be beating us, hitting us over the back, the head, the arms, the gut, the legs. He would make us get down in stances lower than what we had already been doing low. Mm -hmm. And all those competitors out there that know how low Vic Moore used to fight, that's the reason why, because my legs was conditioned, we had to fight low. Well, he uh, was teaching the Sha uh, Yun Fa of karate which is said to be the first form of karate, Shayu Fa, over in the uh, monastery. And he would start teaching us kata, and he had also a two-man kata. And man, we hadn't done anything like that, but that uh, Rising Sun was, was the name of it. And that kata with us fighting each other back and forth, in that kata. They don't run katas like that anymore. I mean, we had to run katas as to be hurting someone. Yeah. Hey, <laughs> killing someone. Life and death. Well, why was the instructor so hard back then? Why did they want everybody to quit? 
all the old terms will tell you that. Uh, they learning karate, they stuck, had to stick with it because the instructor was trying to get them to quit. Nowadays, you know, it's, hey, how much money you got? You know, you can stay, <laughs> you know. Yeah, Back it's a day, business you, now where you ha you need a lot of students to stay. And, and uh, some schools uh, will even make uh, sure they pass them on their belt rankings, even if they don't necessarily earn it. I found that from the 90s from from some of the other students in my classes but back in your day it really just sounded like they wanted to weed people out it wasn't a business they wanted to make sure they had the best of the best the toughest the people that were committed. exactly yeah way exactly. way different yeah <laughs> grandmaster moore i gotta really? ask you this i gotta ask you this when did you uh meet and start training with robert trias well uh after dimitri then it was uh, Jim Wax. He was out on Reading Road, and I stayed with him for a little while. And John Osaka came, a judo instructor from Japan. He first came through Detroit, then he went to Chicago, then he came to Cincinnati, thank God. And he was teaching me all kind of judo techniques and those and canners. And he had never been thrown, and I had him up almost – had him thrown. And that man did a counter. And ever since that day, I've been seeing stars up in the roof. <laughs> so after I had worked with him, he was, he learned from um, uh, the Yamasita brothers and all. Then I went to college and there was a gentleman, uh, Barry Yusudo. He was teaching uh, Shotokan. Mm -hmm. He was in the Japanese Karate Association. And I wanted to join. And uh, he said, Americans can't and joined the Japanese Karate Association. Well, being black and so much prejudice, I took it as, as well. Black people can't join. You know. And after I left college, then I went to Chicago to the uh, World Championship. But up until this time, we have had little inner school competition. Uh, fighting each other at schools and all. And I was pretty good at it. So I had, uh, went to Canada and did work very well. And in 60, 63, in Chicago, was the first world championship. Al Jean Carrillo from Cleveland, Ohio, he, he won that first tournament. And I had to fight him. So he, he took me, you know. And... Uh, I ended up around fourth place. Okay. And there was a gentleman by the name of uh, Count Dante. And Count Dante, John Kehan, was mm -hmm. his name. He told Master Trias, who was at the tournament, giving the tournament. He said, hey, this boy's pretty good. Why don't you let him join your association since you don't have any minorities in it? And Master Trias thought about it and says, well, why don't you fight him? Now, John Kehon, he was rough. He was tough. I mean, he was mm, laying people out. Nobody wanted to fight him. You know, he just couldn't get matches and all. John Kehon said, well, yeah, okay. And we went at it, and we went on it heavy and hard. I couldn't take him, and he couldn't take me. Master Trish said, whoa, this boy is good. Uh, John Kehon said, let him in your association. You'll have a minority in there and a good one. Mm -hmm. He said, okay, yeah. But let me see all your stances. Let me see your blocks, your punches. Yeah. He come up and hit me and punch me, you know, boom, there, yeah, this boy is good. So he took me in the USKA. This is back in 1963. He asked me, he said, oh, why are you only a black belt? After all these years and all the training and your titles in your book, your techniques and all. I said, well, there's no organization that will let me in. I, when I was in college, I tried to get in with the Japanese Karate Association, uh, but they wouldn't let me. So he says, well, let me finish testing you here and stuff. So he promoted me to second degree black belt, and that was <laughs> historical to me, you know. Wow, now. He said, but you have to come to Phoenix, Arizona. 
you have to meet me at all the karate tournaments, and you got to keep moving up in rank. We, we got to keep testing you, and it's going to be hard. And it was hard. Some of the training that I had to do, I had to hit that snowflakes in the snow barefooted. Oh wow! I had to hit that raindrops out in the rain. I had to see a raindrop, and I had to hit it before it hit. You go outside and you hit the raindrop that's coming down, and you see a raindrop, bing! Inside, punching for the mirror, sideways, trying to punch so fast that it became a blur. Train and every day like that. Then had to go to Phoenix, Arizona and train. Then had to go to every tournament, every weekend, somewhere. And most of the training was in the hotel rooms, you know, and all. So that was uh, extremely, extremely hard. And Master Robert E. Trius was just as hard. Just as hard. And I started competing. In 64, I came back. I still couldn't take it. The victory. Us... The rowdy people, we were so rowdy in 63, 64. They didn't want us to come back to Chicago. We couldn't rent a room at any hotel because we would be in fights, breaking the tables, knocking each other over. Who's the toughest? East Coast, West Coast, Midwest, you know, boom. All these champions, now, nowadays champions, was there, you know, trying to make a name for themselves by being so tough. And I was right there with him, you know. So Robert A. Trish, he couldn't uh, couldn't book a, a tournament at, in Chicago. Chicago didn't want any karate people there. <laughs> no, y'all can't come back here. No, you can't be there. They have the police and everybody else, you know, running us as to say out of town. So Robert A. Trish, he... Uh, changed the name from the World Karate Association to the uh, World Grand National Tournament in Miami, Florida. John Pachibas was down there. He he hosted it. So we had to go to Florida in 65. Mm -hmm. Well, in 65, there was a big Mike Foster, <laughs> 270 some odd pounds, 6'5", wow. you know. He was a giant a master. I hope he's still around. Uh, hello, uh, uh, Mike Foster, if you're still there. <laughs> and he would grab guys, pick them up, hit them, and throw them down. I mean, he'd get down on the low key, but I said he had the strength just to grab a guy and pick him up off and hit him, boom. Well, I was pretty good. I would go up into a catch stance. Come up with a good cover, you know, and you can't get in, you couldn't break that cover. But he throw a kick and he kicked my arm so far, it knocked me out of the ring and into the bleachers. <laughs> we didn't have rings at that time, you know. Man, I shook it off. I said, Oh, I went back in there and I had to whoop. I put a whooping on him, jumped up on his leg, grabbed his gi, swing around to the back, chop his neck. Drop down, go between his legs, throw a uh, drop kick on him. I was fired, jump up six feet in the air and throw a flying side kick, tearing him up. Master Robert A. Trius, and as I would swear to this, he said, you're the best karate fighter i ever seen. He said, not only that, later in the year, he said that I was the best teacher that he ever Seen. Wow. That's what I Grandmaster Moore, I gotta ask. Kind of I, I gotta ask. So you beat that guy. He was like 270. How much did you weigh? Oh. Uh 165, 170. So let me small, ask you this. Like, so basically that guy outweighed you by a hundred pounds and you beat him, right? Yes. Yes. I, I want to ask you something. That that was that's amazing, but I want to ask you something because do you know who Michael Jai White is? Yes. Yeah. Okay, yeah, pretty big guy. Yeah, yeah pretty big guy, martial artist, yeah. actor. He basically, his argument 
is that he could beat up Bruce Lee simply because he outweighs Bruce Lee by 100 pounds. That's like his argument. That alone is why he says he could beat up Bruce Lee. Bruce Lee is 132 pounds. I outweigh him by 100 pounds. Size matters a great deal. That's, that's, it's, it's too big of a discrepancy. You know, he can run across the street. I ain't going to feel it. What do you think about that? You beat up a dude who's 100 pounds bigger than you. Uh, I've fought with Bruce Lee. The story is he came to the Grand Nash, uh, to the International, and he challenged any of us uh, national champions, world champions. He said that he had a punch so fast that nobody could block it, could even mm -hmm. touch it, going in or coming out. Artie Simmons, Jimmy Jones, and Vic Moore was there with Robert A. Trias. Robert A. Trias told Ed Parker, uh, I got three guys here. Either one of them can take him. All of us is in about the same weight division. I was about 180 at that time. And uh, Ed, Ed Parker says, you really think so, Bob? That guy, he, he says he's just that fast, you know. Ain't nobody taking him up. Because all the champions were shining him. Oh, see, he's a movie star. He ain't nobody. Uh, he he never won a tournament. He never fought nobody. What's in it for us? A movie role? Ha, 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 ha. What's in it for us? Uh, some money? He, and Master Chris, he turned and looked it up. He said, one of you guys going up there and showing what a show race group karate can do. Uh, uh, Jimmy, you go. Uh, now, uh, Vic, you go. Now, Artie, you go. Vic Moore. Get up there and show him. Well, I had to run on up there. When you start to speak like that, you better get the moving. Bruce Lee gets back. He says, oh, I'm going to come in, throw a punch, hit you in the chest. You won't be able to touch it. And I screwed stuff and said, you're going to do what? He said, yes, I'm going to come in and punch. I ain't going to hit you hard. I'm just going to tag you and let you know I was there. I said to myself, I said, lightning is fast, and I damn near keep up with it. You know, Bruce. Oh. Everybody was laughing, you know. He'd come in and he'd throw his punch. I blocked it. Tom Hill blocked it. I said, that's you. Bruce Lee was shot. He back up. He says, well, let's try it again. Okay. He gets back, and I know he's coming in super fast. I see his face expression. I know he's coming in. His ear, eyes. I know he's coming on the right side. he come in, speedy punch. I blocked it. Bang! Man, he backed up. He was scoffed. He was stunned. He, he didn't know what to think. He reached out and patted me on my right arm. He said, boy, you're fast. You're the fastest American I ever seen. He said, let's try just one more time, you know. So we get back, and the crowd was hooping and hollering and stumping their feet. Steve Sanders Muhammad, he admit that he was the one I'm stumping his feet and hollering. And I just glanced off up into the bleachers, you know. And Bruce Lee threw a backhand strike, never coming close. And as you look at the video, you see he's two and a half feet away. But he's throwing this strike, and the cameraman, whoever he was, we got a good idea who he was, he starts showing it over and over, this one strike over and over. And that's what you see on the Internet when you see uh, Bruce Lee versus Vic Moore over and over. But how you know it's the same strike over and over, his left hand comes to his left side and it's crooked back like a, ball, like a baseball player would be trying to catch a ball. And he's up on his left toe. There's no way you can go over and over throwing blows and come back in the exact same position. His head stopped at the same position every time. My finger is pointing. I ask him, I say, why are you striking at the head when you're supposed to be punching at the chest, you know? <laughs> I said, you're just trying to sneak something in, you know, and I'm blocked it. So you'll see my finger in the exact same spot, and you took a marker pen and put a dot there in his head, my head. Everything is in the exact same spot over and over. But when he was throwing his punches at me, there was a guy in a white shirt that was walking up the bleachers. That's how you know it's motion in the background. Then when Bruce Lee threw his second punch, the guy in the white shirt that was walking up the bleachers had crossed over to his seat. And that's when he threw. Now, with these backhand strikes, there's no more movement. No flash book going off. Nobody crossing their leg. Nobody's making any movement. It was the same blow over and over it, two and a half feet away. But they try to make it look like he's throwing all these punches. Well, 
Yes, I beat Bruce Lee because I threw my punches at him before he walked away. I said, wait a minute, Bruce, let me show you how it's done. I threw my punches at him. Boom. He missed. He said, mm. I said, we'll go again. I came back. I threw my punches at him, but this time I hit him a little harder, knocked him back. Boom. He blocked that one. Man. And everybody was booing him, pooping and hollering. The man had tears in his eyes for a full gun. I said, uh, we'll go one more time. He said, no, you are the faster. That was his word, exact word. I said, well, come on. You threw three, so I'll throw three. He said, okay. I feel sorry for him. I just threw a regular speedy punch. He blocked that one, you know. Then afterwards, he says, um, Wow, you get so fast. Who who taught you? I pointed to my instructor, Robert Trias, over there, just like that with my thumb. I said, that's my instructor over there. He said, wow. So I was telling him, I said, how you make me get out in the rain and in the snow and stuff and to the mirror inside and all that, you know. And Go outside and you hit the raindrop that's coming down and you see a raindrop, bing! Take a stick and drop it and be able to throw a punch and hit before the stick can hit the ground. And he said, oh, man, you just had Mother Nature working with you, didn't you? I said, well, yeah, you know. So that was it. Then he says, uh, I like to spar with you. I've got this new style, Ji Kwon Do. I say, what? And he said, yeah, Ji Kwon Do, you know. Hey, let, let's go around the side and, and, and spar a little bit. Which we did. We went around that spot. He doing all this jumping and fancy footwork. He couldn't touch me. I was tagging him every right. I was sweeping him. I was hitting him. Boom. Where I forgot. Was there That's an right. audience? Were there anybody that seen that? There was uh, uh, a few people there. There was had to be three or four cameramans that was there. So I know somebody got it. And there was only two or three other people because he didn't want to do it out in public. He wanted to do it in private because when I was throwing my punches at him, he missed. Now, just get back to your question. Mm -hmm. Just because he makes movies does not make him really that fast for real. I'm not the only one that could have beaten Bruce Lee and did, you know. Yes, but there's all of the national champions that I have fought that I knew could have beaten Bruce Lee. Steve Sanders, for one, I know. I watched him. I worked with him, you know, in his training. And Bruce Lee told him he was the fastest American he had seen at that time, you know, boom. I could name just about every national champion out there that I fought that could have beat Bruce Lee. People question me, oh, you think Vic Moore beat Bruce Lee? With a little bit of history of mine, Vic Moore. In 1965, beating Big Mike Foster, I become the first grand national champion in the world. In the United States, that made me the first African-American black in the United States. There was no other black before then, 63, winning any championships. You know. In 1966, I defeated the all Hawaiian champion that came here in a, a, a world championship, Master Robert Trist, would even pay other people to come from other countries to make sure that we have a, a group from other countries. Mm -hmm. I defeated him. In 1967, I defeated the all uh, Korean champion at June Rees National Tournament. They had a delegation of 16 people. Their uh, uh, government had sent over here, and, and they thought he was going to win. And he's over there doing full splits, putting his foot up over his head and all. Oh, Vic Moore, you see who you're going to have to fight? I said, I don't care. That wall don't punch back. Oh, <laughs> listen to him, you know. And he went up. He did that normal Korean stuff. They back up two steps. They go up for that flying side kick. I see the two steps going back, but I jumped straight up in the air. And I did a side kick inside of his side kick and knocked him out of the ring. 
they hated my guts, you know. They they just, you know, mm, they was gonna attack us. Jimmy said, Should I call the police? You know, I said, No. My students was there. We carried samurai swords, machetes, thighs, bow sticks. Uh-uh. And they didn't try nothing after that tournament. That was in 67. 67 was when me and Bruce Lee uh, did our demonstration, and I beat him. I beat him. Fair and fair. And then uh, Chuck Norris and I, we fought. I beat Chuck Norris. He did a spinning back kick. Threw that shoulder forward. He did many spin. Bam. Steve Armstrong didn't want me to have the points. All the judges' flag was up. They had a meeting. He says, hey, guys, we can't let this <laughs> beat our champion, you know. Well, man, come out, Chuck Norris, hit me on the arm. Uh, and that's it. That's the one. Boom, boom, go. We got ready to leave. Well, Chuck Norris threw his hands up and says, Vic, you know we didn't have nothing. I didn't have nothing to do with that. We get so ready to leave. He said, Chuck hold, Norris hold on. beat you technically, but you're saying you beat yeah. him. But they kind of cheated it. Yes. Chuck Norris took it. Oh, oh, big time. He ain't the, he, that wasn't the only time either. Chuck Norris took his program. He said, to the guy that beat me fair and square. I said, oh, Chuck, you don't have to do that. Chuck Norris' wife at the time, she took her program, did the same thing. She said, to the man that beat my husband, Rick Moore. Everyone in the whole arena knew what was going on. Mm -hmm. They was booing him and everything else, you know. I, I, I hate to be too negative here, but Steve Armstrong from Seattle, Washington, was the most against black folks, you know, the worst. Now, when I first started, see, I was used to this stuff. When I first started competing, they would say, come out and says, wait a minute, this boy can't come in here. Master Tria says, if you don't let this boy in, you're not going to have a tournament because he's the defending champion. Mm -hmm. Oh, oh, oh. Well. well, he had to come around to the back. Master Tria says, no, I got 500 competitors out here, and I'll take them somewhere else if you don't let this boy come in this door and compete. Other tournaments I used to go to, and they say, Vic Moore, you're not going to win this tournament. I say, how are you going to stop me? We got three out of five judges. Hmm. Meaning, we ain't going to call you points because you need three judges out of five or two out of three, you know. Mm -hmm. and, and tournament after tournament I would go to, but I would fight so hard they had to give it to me because I was beating everybody there was. Okay? Now, that was in 67. 68, I defeated Joe Lewis to become the first world pro karate champion. Wow. So I'm a, a professional now. That's when we first started giving a little money away, you know. And I beat Joe Lewis at that tournament. My wife also uh, won in the brown belt division. And she was uh, fighting men <laughs> and women with wow really permitted to fight in men division back then. Now, <laughs> then in 69, at the team championships in California, I defeated, the, what was his name, the black guy uh, with the afro? Uh, Jim, Jim Kelly. Kelly. Man, you come right out of a comic book. Jim, oh, really? Jim Kelly at the team, at the team championships. In 69, that was in 69. I also defeated my idol, Mike Stone. Oh, wow. Mike Stone had 91 straight victory, never took a second of place. You know, hats off, hey, Mike, how you doing, buddy? You know, Mike Stone, my idol, and I beat him. And we had been going back and forth, back and forth. I'm a drop kicker. Mike Stone's a drop kicker. Uh, Jim Harris was a drop kicker. What do you mean a Brit drop Rian kicker? was a drop kicker. Oh, you drop down and you kick up, not, you know, jumping up like these wrestlers do and kick, but kicking the guy, dropping down. We were able to kick to the groin and the gut, you know, boom, oh, on the okay. floor, okay. dropping up. And then, boom. Well, us four, we was the top drop kickers, and Mike Stone and I, we're fighting, and I said, I got to I gotta take him out. I got to take him out. I dropped down, did a drop kick. He blocked it. Boom. He looked down at me and smiled. I looked up. Man, he blocked. He dropped it. We fight a little more. So Mike Stone decided he's going to do his drop kick. 
he dropped down the drop kick on me, and you don't get away much from a drop kick. And I blocked his. I looked down at him, smile. He looked up at me and smiled. And then we went on. Mike's not as he'll tell you to this day. He would hook your leg to sweep you and throw a wrist in and take you out, you know, right between the eyes. The ambulance used to be at, at the door to take us to the hospital, you know, from time to time. Well, that's how he used to beat the stew out of everybody. He would throw that red hand and that sweet boom. Well, he hooked my leg. I said, oh, Lord, I'm in his trap. His arm was coming. I dropped on his arm. I threw my red hand at him and swept him, counter it, thanks to John Osaka, who had taught me how to counter any uh, go and sweep. He went airborne. He went about two or three feet in there spinning, and he came down on his shoulder and head and dislocated his shoulder, Ooh. and he was out. And uh, I kind of felt bad that I had to be that rough on him, you know, boom. But we went in the dressing room, and he was, you know, trying to work his shoulder. And he said, I'm going to have to possibly go to the hospital. You know, my shoulder's way out of the way. I said, well, are we going to finish? He says, uh, no. I said, well, I can fight with one arm. He said, no, Vic, you, you, you were the better. You know, man, that's a great honor. The master Trish told me I was the best fighter he's seen and the best teacher sticks with me forever. When Mike Stone told me that I was the better, sticks right in my heart. Now, Bruce was like, ah, you know, he never beat anybody. He never fought anybody. People questioned me about beating Bruce Lee. Why don't they question me about beating Big Mike of Foster to become the first world grand national champion? Why don't they talk uh, question me about beating Mike Stone. Mike Stone had 91 straight victories, never took the second or third place. Mike Stone beat everybody. Why don't they question me about him? Joe Lewis was a great fighter. Mm -hmm. Never, no question. 1970, I beat Bill Wallace at the World Championship. You know, wow. boom. I hit him with a rich hand and then a shoe toe and all. I beat every national champion that was fighting out there that I fought, you know. People want to question Vic Moore beating Bruce Lee. Mm -hmm. I told you the story about uh, Bruce Lee and all these guys. Any of the national champions could have beat Bruce Lee. Chuck Norris could have beaten Bruce Lee. And, and it's no question about it. Chuck Norris could have beat the stew out of Bruce Lee in a wow. real fight. Now, a lot of people say, oh, Chuck Norris, oh, he, uh, and, and oh, Chuck Norris never uh, did full contact. Uh, now, Joe Lewis and I, we founded, we started Full Contact Karate. A lot of people don't know that. That's back in 1969, back in there on the Murray Griffin National TV show. Most people were scared to fight uh, Joe Lewis. They didn't want to fight Joe Lewis because he was so tough and so strong. Well, he was stronger than me, bigger than me, but I was so tough and I had beaten him. He would always want to get me to demonstrate, you know, and we demonstrated full contact karate. And we were going at it. So, and we all had, we had agreed, we ain't going to try and kill each other. Okay, Vic, don't try and kill me. Okay, Joe, don't try and kill me. And we was fighting so hard that the uh, producer came out and stopped the session. He said, uh-uh, you guys are going to kill each other, you know. But we were only demonstrating what full contact karate is going to look like, mm -hmm. making way for MMA, really. And we did the first full contact karate tournament out in California. Joe Lewis and Greg Burns fought, Vic Moore and Jim Harrison fought. And that's another Steve Armstrong referee. Won't even go into that. I'm selling pictures and I can show people. Um, refereeing that uh, the Ku Klux Klan's on their leg of their knees and stuff. And uh, like I said, I used to go to tournaments. They said, he can't come in here. You're not going to win. Uh, go home. 
I would be in tournaments sometimes that they would be riding outside, tearing up white people's cars and breaking windows and, and cutting tires, and I'm in there fighting. And I expect to be winning. <laughs> That yeah, that's hard. crazy. Yeah, so, so Grandmaster Moore, you're saying you really won that Jim Harrison fight, then, right? Even though technically on record, oh yeah, he's... oh yeah. Okay. See, uh, what, what it was, um, it's supposed to be if anybody get knocked down three times, they were going to call it. Mm -hmm. I had knocked Jim down three times. They didn't call it. Mm -hmm. It had said if anybody get cut severely. It's going to be called over. Jim Harrison had seven cuts all over his face. They had to stop the match several times to patch him up with butterfly uh, stitches. You know. Well, we were fighting, and I caught an elbow right in between the eyes when he was swinging, and it floored me. I went down. But with my stupid self, I jumped up too fast. You know, anybody that tell you if you get shook up and you jump up too fast, Blood rush to your head, and you're going to stagger. And that's what happened. And Steve Armstrong, oh, that, that's it. That's the fan. I ran up oh, there. So no, call. hey, what okay. you talking about? Oh, oh, no, no, no. That's that's it. Yeah, that's uh, I said, I'm all right. And, oh, oh, no, 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 no. Steve Armstrong, three and four times, did that in my matches. You know? uh, but yes. Uh, Chuck Norris would have beaten Bruce Lee. Steve Armstrong would have beaten Bruce Lee. Mike Stone would have beaten Bruce Lee. Chuck Norris definitely would have beaten him. And, and, and how many more? I mean, I Well, the question, now, going back, Grandmaster Moore, the question, what about Michael Jai White? Michael John White? Yeah. Just to watch him and see some of his moves and stuff. I don't go for all this movie fighting stuff. See, I've been in seven movies myself. I know you ain't hitting each other for real and all that stuff. But I would have to put my eyes on Michael J. because of his build, his strength, his size. But not Even only you because beat up of the small man guy who was a lot bigger man. than you. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, dynamite. Dynamite. Now, all of these national champions and stuff out there, they would have beaten Bruce Lee. It's no question. Now, I would say you guys have to guess that. Uh, well, I think, uh, well, I put my money on me. I more or less know that when you have fought both people for real and you know the difference, you know, in their speed and their strength and them, I have a more sure and of who would beat who. Mm -hmm. I don't have to guess as much as you guys do. Y'all don't know if Bruce Lee would have beat him or him or him unless you both have beat, brought, you know, to like both of them. Have you fought both of them? If you ever fought both of them, you really don't know. Mm -hmm. Michael J. White, muscular, built. Mm -hmm. I like for him to play me in, in, in my movies that's coming up. You know, hey, Michael, how you doing? Come, come on, play me. He's I'm tall, sure. I'm sure. Know, I'm sure he would love to film a scene if he plays you back in '67, he, beating he Bruce would, Lee. He would, would be tough. sold on he, that part right away. <laughs> it is the truth. Then in '75. I trained a chimpanzee to do karate. I heard about that. I, I wanted to ask you about did. that. Uh, so whose idea was yeah. that? Whose idea was that? Oh, well, me and my wife at the time, you know, uh, karate started going downhill. 65, you know. And all. I said, you know, I could teach an elephant karate if we could listen and, and learn, you know, better than these people out there calling just doing karate now, stumping around, moving around, you know, jumping up and down. He said, what? I said, yeah, I could teach any, I can teach an animal how to do karate better than these people are teaching karate nowadays. He said, what about uh, an eight, you know? I said, yeah, I could take an eight and teach an eight. We said, yeah, but we got no place to keep one. You know, where we keep training? And then we said, I got a chimpanzee. There was a zoo, a small zoo in, in uh, uh, Fayetteville, North Carolina. 
where we were living at the time. Mm -hmm. And this zoo had people come by and just look at different animals and stuff. Naturally, the chimpanzee was caged up, you know, and uh, we go by and we see this chimp from time to time. This small zoo was closing up, so he was open to the uh, possibility to uh, sell the chimp. Well, the chimpanzee was four years of age. Mm -hmm. As any zoo person, they'll tell you, when a chimp get four years of age, you got to get rid of them because they're too vicious. Mm -hmm. A chimpanzee has four times the strength of a human. You don't put your hand up on a cage with a chimpanzee because they can grab your finger and pull it off almost hold you in. Wow. They could jump up and do a double back kick and break the chest bone. Mm -hmm. A chimpanzee got uh, the veins, you know, they can break your bone with one bite. You know. A chimpanzee is very dangerous. Don't buy a chimpanzee. Don't try and mess around with a chimpanzee because it is dangerous. You know, it, it, mm. Well, I knew judo, jujitsu, karate, you know, kung fu, you name it. I'm a world champion, you know. Hey, we're going to get that chimp. The USDA family gave us a, a license to get the chimpanzee, and we got the chimpanzee. But first, I had to fight that chimpanzee. And if I didn't know judo, jujitsu, and karate, and boxing, well, I didn't tell you, I used to box at the Merrill's. YMCA and the 9th Street YMCA in Cincinnati, Ohio. I had 12 amateur fights and I won all 12 fights. Wow. I, I was Tiger Joe Harris sparring partner, but I won those 12 fights because I cheated. I cheated. I would what hit with a cheated? karate punch instead of boxing. I hit with a karate punch instead of a boxing punch. I mean, that's still allowed though, right? I, I wouldn't really say that's cheating. I'd say that's just doing it different. Yeah. But, uh, hey, you break some bones. I hit people, knock them out. I've actually, mm, well, I don't want to. I've been in life and death situations. When I learned karate, we didn't learn karate for tournaments. We mm -hmm. didn't learn karate for trophies and all that stuff. We were taught by people that learned karate to kill. So when they got out of the military and started teaching karate here in the United States, ask any old time, they'll tell you the same thing. You were taught to disable a person. You, you were taught to lay them out. You weren't taught karate for a tournament, for a point. That's why they were so strict on us. That's why these old timers, you know, Jerry Pennington and, 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 and all these guys, uh, all these champions, uh, Joe Lewis and all, was in the military. And they didn't learn karate for just a sport. Nowadays, that's all it is. And it's a weak sport at that, you know. So it doesn't play. But I had to fight that chimp. And me and that chimp went at it. And I tell you. If I didn't know all the martial arts that I knew that chimp could kill me, I had a stick about that long of a broomstick like they use in uh, schools and restaurants, you know, the, the big handle of, of a broom and had it cut off and it was like a club. You know? And I could hit that chimp, beat that chimp, and it didn't do nothing, just shake, just shake it off. Wow. I hit that chimp so hard. Now, I used to break eight inches of concrete with the side of my hand. Mm -hmm. I used to demonstrate that in New York back in the olden days, you know, some of the first tournaments. I used to break eight inches of concrete with the side of my hand. I break three inches of concrete with my knuckles, and I could hit anything and break it. Now, I lost two jobs, construction jobs, because I would be breaking up all the concrete blocks and the bricks. I'd take a house brick, set it down, boom, break it. The supervisor come by, why is all these bricks broken up? Everybody came, pointing at me, the karate man. Yeah. Get your stuff and go home, you know. 
I lost two jobs because I would break up all the bricks and, and stuff. But anyway, back to the chimp. I would hit that chimp so hard that my arm would ache. My arm would ache all over. And I hit that chimp fancy hard enough to kill a man. You know, there's no question about it. I don't want to get into chimp, all though, So did he live with you and your wife, Grandmaster Moore? Was this chimp like your roommate? Yes. He's in the bed. Now, it's on the internet, matter of fact. You oh, there, are there to, videos uh, of it? Yes. Uh, yes. Uh, oh, by the way, I'm, I wrote a book. I wrote a book about my chimpanzee doing karate. Also, we got another book ready to come out. Uh, my chimp shooting pool. Uh, my chimp going dancing and stuff. All that. My chimp lived in a... I got to ask you. I, I got to ask you. Uh, how long... So you were you were beating the chimp, but how long did it take you to actually teach him karate? About six months. About six months. About six months. Yeah, because the chimpanzee know he can beat you. The chimpanzee know he don't have to listen to you, you know. And but the chimp had to respect me. He started respecting me little by little by little because. He seen that I was just as tough as he was. Now, I fought chimpanzees. Mm -hmm. Master Robert Triss had me riding the wild horses. I had, to, as part of my training, he had some friends out in Arizona that had a ranch that they broke horses in. He says, Victor, you got to go some more training. I say, more training? What? You know, I'm thinking I'm going to be punching a bag or sparring with somebody. And we're going to this horse ranch, you know, we were looking there. You know, all these horses and bulls and I, uh, I'm wondering why are we out there? Man, they breaking horses and getting thrown all over the place, stepped on. Uh, Vic, I want you to get in there and break this horse. I never been on a horse in my life. Uh -huh. What you talking about, Sensei? Vic, you're going to get out there and break that horse in. Uh, so I got up on it and it's going on <clears throat> and uh you ever been on a horse? I say no sir I've never been on a horse uh, so you you don't know what to do N no sir I don't know squeeze your knees in that's against our karate we force our knees out turn your feet out spare in karate we turn our feet in lean back stay back in karate we keep our back straight. We, they tell me all this stuff that is against my karate. But I like when I took ballet. I took ballet also, you know. Oh, you did? And we had to turn up to get out and get to do this, you know. And, all. and I wasn't very good at it, but I was good enough for in uh, a play mm -hmm. called The King and I, and also Nutcracker Sweet. And I did pretty fair. I was a catcher, and, and, you know, but wasn't my thing, but it helped me in karate, you know. Oh, yeah, Especially just, just like Jean-Claude Van Damme, it helped. So when I was uh, out there and I had to get on this horse and they opened the gate and I'm doing all this they told me to do, and I'm kind of hanging on there, you know. Then the horse ran over to the fence and he stopped to try and throw me over. And I know it. And I leaned way back, you know, and almost then the horse, he throw me off. Master Trish says, Rick, you got to get up on that horse, and you got to break that horse. Now, you just get up there and pretend that's Joe Lewis and y'all fighting, and and you got to win this match. So he knew how to get me going, saying uh, that horse is like Joe Lewis, you know. Mm -hmm. Well, I went back, got up on the horse, you know. They say, you ready? Yes. Boom, go. I rode that horse, and I broke that horse. Well, the next day I had to go back out there and they had this white horse that had only been uh, ridden once. And I'm thinking I'm I'm a horse breaker now. You know, I'm thinking I'm good. And I went on that horse. He runs to the fence and he stopped. I don't fall. I lay all the way back on him. The horse says, okay. Then, okay. That horse went. There was a big puddle of mud because it had been raining. That, uh, day. that horse came up there and he stopped and tried to throw me off. I wouldn't go. I leaned all the way back. 
That horse got smart. He said, okay. He got down on his front knees and he put his head down. And I'm on this horse, no saddle. And he, I'm sliding down. And I'm trying to reach and grab for the horse tail, but I couldn't even get his tail. And I slid down in that mud, boy, and everybody laughed, you know. And that was part of my karate training. That was it. Now, uh, the knowing how much nerve I had, another little interesting story you might like to hear. I was in Cincinnati, Ohio, and I wanted to take flying lessons. And, you know, people say, oh, karate man, huh? What kind of nerve you got, you know, and all. So, and I was still young, you know, stupid, you know. <laughs> and I get in the airplane the first time, very first time, um, in a Cessna 150. And we're going flying, breaking the wind. See, when the wind blow, you break into it, you know, and whatnot. Oh, pretty good, you know. Mm -hmm. I'm handling this. He says, "So you, you, you never had any flying?" I said, "No." And we was on a what is called a tricycle. A tricycle's got that uh, little small wheel on the back. It's not like the regular planes this day and time, you know. A uh, level. It's more a uh, 45 degree angle, you know, and you got a whole back on it to keep that back wheel on the ground. I did okay with that. Next flying lesson, he got this special plane we're going to go up in. We're doing what is called flare outs. We fly, and then all of a sudden he cuts that engine off. Engine off, the plane is dropping, going down. I'm looking at him, he's looking at me, he says, What are we going to do? So I don't know. He said, Now, when your plane does this, push in on the rudder and you pick up speed. I say, but you're heading to the ground. He said, yeah. We push, we pick up speed, and I get airspeed, then it levels off. He said, hey, you're pretty good, guy. He said, uh, most people get nervous and start screaming and hollering. He says, we'll try something the next day. The next day, you know what we do? It. We're flying upside down, several feet, just a few feet off the ground. Mm -hmm. And man, I hung in there. He looked over at me and says, you got the nerve, boy. You can you can fly, you know. So he started regular teaching me then. So, yes, I have that nerve. I don't like height that much. But, uh, hey, I love flying. I like flying. I'm a uh, EMT. I'm off the fire department. I had to repel. I like repelling down. I know how to repel. I know how to go into a burning building. <laughs> I'm out safely. So I got a big history, you know, right behind me. But that chimpanzee, that was one of the people says, who was your toughest competitor? That chimpanzee, Trudy is her name. Catch her on a video doing, uh, sleeping in the bed, making up her bed, mm -hmm. frying bacon and eggs, and sitting at the table, drinking coffee and eating her toast and, and bacon and all Giving the chimpanzee some coins and the chimp take the corners, uh, two quarters, and go put it into the machine and pull out the drink that she liked, which was orange or grape. And then she'd go outside and sit up on a parking meter and drink her Coke waving at the cars going by. Whatever happened that to that chimpanzee? Oh, uh, well, the chimp finally died. It got a cold because... Chimp can't handle cold. They got to live in good human, uh, good weather. Uh, and see now, physically, she's strong. Those chimps, they fall out of trees. That's why their skull is so strong, you know, so much harder than us, you know. Because mm. my dad used to say, boy, you got a hard head. Yeah, but <laughs> not like them chimpanzee. <laughs> yeah. Sort of the... Uh, Traditional World Karate Association. The Traditional World Karate Association is about maintaining traditional karate. Okay. Knowing a certain number of stances. Fighting from a certain number of stances. Not jumping up and down and running around and falling down, you know, and all that crap. Fighting from solid stances and being able to throw a blow 
that could have hurt a person. When did Someone you start that, that association? 1975. Oh, you started it way back in the day. Okay. Yes. And being able to punch with a karate punch, not swinging and boxing and, and everything. No. Throwing karate punches, doing karate blocks, and not just doing any old kind of thing, you know, to stop from getting hit. Showing that you have the perfection of karate. Being in karate for a minimum number of years and for a black belt at minimum of two years, where it used to be five and seven years. Mm -hmm. Uh uh. No black belt is given at a year, two years, and these kids are grandmasters and all this stuff. And there's one more thing I like to say, you know, excuse, excuse my language. Well, no, I'm just sitting on the couch today. These Korean, Korean styles. You ask a Korean style person, you do Korean? You do karate? No, I don't do karate. I do Taekwondo. Taekwondo. I do Taekwondo. Big more, you do karate? Yes, yes. Uh, I don't do karate. I do Taekwondo. What in the world do you do difference in Taekwondo than we do in karate? You have punches, you got stances, you got blocks, you got what in the in a world that you do different in Taekwondo. Taekwondo people have been so brainwashed that they don't even recognize that they are a karate group. It's a play of names. We don't have to call it karate. We can call it Kuchi Kuchi Roo. Do you do Kuchi Kuchi Roo? Yeah, I do Kuchi Kuchi Roo. Hey, you, do you uh, drive a car? Uh, no, I don't drive a car. I drive a Toyota. Do you do karate? No, I don't do karate. I do Taekwondo. Do you do? Do you drive an automobile? Uh, no, uh, I drive a Honda. I don't drive an automobile. That's uh, these Taekwondo people. Look at their uh, their Taekwondo. Now, why do they change the name? Well, a little history will tell us. Back in the early 1900s, the Japanese and the Okinawans got career confiscated under their ruling. The wise was taken away, some of the kids was taken away, the wise being raped, the uh, uh, guys being beaten, you know. Us black folks, we went through a, a tough time ourselves. The uh, Koreans was going through a tough time. The Jews, the Holocaust, and all this stuff, you know, different races had different times. So I can kind of sympathize with the Koreans to that respect, that outlook. But uh, when they got their freedom and, and out from an, under the Japanese, you know, they didn't want to have nothing to do with the Japanese. They didn't want to use no language that the Japanese had. They didn't want their uniforms, their clothes, and nothing that looked like anything from Japan. That's why the Koreans start putting this border on their geese. That's why they took the highest belt, took the highest belt, the red belt of the martial arts, and degraded down to a brown belt. Excuse me. I dare they take the highest martial art belt and all martial arts, jujitsu, judo, karate, take the ultimate belt that we had to train for and degrade this belt down to a brown belt because they didn't want to have nothing to do with the Japanese. So we're going to get back at you, you know, boom. They take a, a blue belt. When the belt color going from yellow, blue, green, purple, brown, three classes of brown, black belt, they take down, reach down and grab a blue belt and put it around a person for a black belt. I dare you. I dare you. Now, and also they take their uniforms. And now we're walking around with V-neck sweaters on that the Koreans start, you know, and all. They, we're going to change the whole outlook. Okay, Vic, why are you so hard on the Koreans? Because they have cheated in so many tournaments back in the late 60s and, and the 70s. 
we go to tournaments, we're not going to call any points on these Americans. And we're not going to give them any recognition. Have meetings. Now, black belts used to have meetings to discuss the terms of karate for that day. Mm -hmm. Only Koreans can come into the meeting. All these new, new, new newcomers, they don't know nothing about this stuff I'm talking now. So I'm talking way over their head. Don't call no American points. Cheat if you have to. If it's not a Korean, let it be a Korean stylist. If it's not a Korean stylist, a friend of a Korean. And Ernest Lib. Ernest Lib, bless his heart. I hope he's still around, but I think he was in a plane crash. He was in Canada with us, and he knew what was going on in the meeting because he was married to a Korean woman. So when I was first coming up competing, going to Canada, and these Koreans there, and they're having their meetings, and they know what they're going to be saying and doing, Ernest Lib would go in because you had to be a Korean to go in or another or in them. He was married to a Korean woman and he heard them saying all of this stuff. And when these Koreans came here and getting off the boat as white belts and brown belts or whatever, and promoting themselves to a fifth degree black belt or a fourth degree black belt. Because back in the days, the fifth degree was the most highest belt that we had. We didn't have all these sixth, seventh, eighth, and ninth, and tenth grade like we got nowadays. Nowadays, everybody's a master. Who's the master? Show up! Who's the master? Show up! Who's the master? Young kids is a grandmaster, 12, 13 years old. Guy's been in karate for 10 or 20 years. Everybody's a grandmaster. Everybody's a, a world champion. Everybody's a grand national champion for 5, 10, 20 years. Who in the world did they fight? Who did all these champions you see on the internet nowadays? That's so many champions. 10 grand national champions, uh, five world champions, uh, this and that and that. Stop. Hold it. Internet people, stop and ask them, who did they fight? Where did they fight? Where was these tournaments at? When? What, what year was this? Uh, uh, this year, that year? No, they can't answer that. They can't name not one person that they fought. They can't name not one tournament. You may not wish to fight me now, sucker, but you will. I'm going to see to that. They can't even name the year. But all these grand national champions now, oh, everybody's a grand national champion. Everybody's a grand master. Uh, yeah, uh, everybody done taught so many thousands of karate people. How many darn karate people was in your dojo? Where did you learn? When did you teach all these thousands of people karate? Just name one person that they fought and call Vic Moore. I like to hear it. Gra Grandmaster Moore, I got to ask you this. I have to ask you this. I got to ask you about Frank Dukes. Meet Frank Dukes, the first American to win the Kumite, a deadly martial arts competition where the only rule is to win. And his so-called fights. Yeah, uh, I, I don't know anything about him. Frank Duke is my friend. Yeah, I yeah, like I like Frank him too. Duke. But you know, people will question his fight I, record because of the uh, they were underground fights. Yeah, I I think a lot of Frank Duke's fight and my buddy is, is exaggerated, you know, mm -hmm. because if he had to fall up under my questions, my ruling, name one, name where, <laughs> name who, you know. Uh, He'll say, oh, he can't name anybody he fought. I said, really? There's Vic Moore, Fred Brewster. I mean, I can name the names. You should have some kind of recommendation, a, a record, you know, newspaper, magazines or so. Vic Moore, you beat Bruce Lee? Yes, I beat Bruce Lee. 
where Bruce Lee did a demonstration with a guy named Vic Moore. And contrary to what people say in the internet, so Vic actually won the, won the, 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 the contest. It was a test of speed okay. between the two of them. Right. Uh, it just gives you an idea how history can be distorted in a way. And maybe that's one of the reasons I've had problems in the past because I do know the truth and everyone wants to keep me quiet, you know. Because there's some part of the video that shows me beating him, blocking his punches. No, you don't see my punches that I do at Bruce Lee. That's that's cut. You don't even see it. You don't see us sparring and me beating him. Well, do you think this contest was just one-sided, just the punches that Bruce Lee threw? Uh, well, that, that's it. That's it. What about the punches I threw? What about us sparring? Why y'all cut that out? But we know possibly there's somebody that got the video of it. We need to see and that they video. Just don't know what they got. Let me ask you this, Grandmaster Moore, though. Uh, Grandmaster Moore, let me ask you this, because people know you have like um, like an association with Frank Dukes. Like, can you confirm the story? And this relates back to the Black Dragons and all that, and Robert Trias, and, uh, you know, because he hears so many different stories. So, like, for, I think Frank Dukes said you and him actually sparred back in the day when he was like 14. Is that true? I didn't have to oh. <laughs> you still got it. <laughs> oh, no, I miss it. Oh, yeah. this, is, this is the man who made me. And he gave me a shot when I was like 13 years old and then again at 17. Yeah. You know? So, cut my teeth out with this guy. No, 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 that's, that's an exaggeration. That comes from a movie we possibly wanted to make. And we were looking at, uh, uh, what's that, Steven, Steven Seagal? Anyway, there, there was a movie that was showing uh, a black guy and a white guy fighting, you know, and go back and come back, you know, different ones, you know, like that, to, to make an interesting movie. No, no, we never fought, but he's my friend, you know. Oh, you guys never sparred at all, though? We have. No, no. Okay. Frank Dukes happened to be one of those uh, young guys that I took a liking to uh, after getting a little spanking there. And next year he comes back with improvement. And I like that. I like that. Well, how, how'd you meet him? Did you meet him through like the Black Dragon Society then? Oh, uh, you know, you know, we. I was at a Hall of Fame type thing, you know, and all. And we sat and we ate together and whatnot. And we had good conversations and we talked about some uh, ventures and whatnot. And I've shown him some techniques and whatnot. Basically, that's, that's the extent of it, you know. Mm. I, I, mean, I, I don't want to down him, but uh, where and when these fights, I don't know. I wasn't there. Kumite, just is going back to like when I when I first talked about it in Black Belt Magazine. It was it's a learning experience. It's a it's a rite of passage. It's not a contest about putting butts in seats. Okay, that's really important to understand. Being in the military and doing this and that, and with the FBI and all this, I don't know. Mm -hmm. I wasn't there. I don't know any of that. I don't believe everything that I hear. You know, a lot of people don't believe, as I said, they more beat Bruce Lee. This is an interesting story in your history. So at one point you were a bodyguard and I heard you used to bodyguard James Brown. Oh, yeah, right. I was James Brown bodyguard, you know. Wasn't too big of a, a deal, you know, but when you think about it nowadays, you know, how famous he was, you know, then yes. He used to come to my karate school on Montgomery Road in Cincinnati, and he had a, a recording studio right around the corner. And he used to come around and watch us work out and whatnot. And <laughs> I don't know if I should tell this. He'd come around and a woman come by, you know, and he's coming out. 
oh, are you Vic Mar? Are you that world karate champion guy? James Brown. Uh, yes. Yes, I am. And do a little flashy moves, you know, and all. And uh, one step led to another step, and they went off, you know, bam. I feel good. Okay. So another day, I'm around the corner at his studio. And I had a nice looking car, uh, cat like, with curtains to the window and all, you know, kind of pimpy fight looking, you know. And I was getting out, and I used to wear my hair like James Brown, you know, whatnot. Mm -hmm. And I'm getting out, and this girl, she come by and she says, uh, Oh, are you James Brown? Oh, and I remember he took this girl off saying he was Vic Moore, the karate champion. So one thing led to another, you know, and uh, another day we was talking. Uh, Vic, I understand you took this girl off, you know, blah, blah. I said, well, you took this girl off. You told her you were Vic Moore, the world champion. Well, Vic Moore, you got to quit telling people you're James Brown. And we laugh, you know. <laughs> yeah, but uh, uh, the defense part is just most of the time you got to keep a person's arm off of them, you know. And that comes from my circular motion uh, blocking, you know. Mm -hmm. Very seldom we had to hit a person or take a person down to the ground, you know. Yeah, I miss old James. How long did you uh, work with him? Like, how long were you his bodyguard? Years. Two or three years. Two, three years? Okay. Anytime you came to Cincinnati, yeah. Mm -hmm. And I'll say this about Cincinnati. Cincinnati has had some of the top singers uh, from Cincinnati, the Isley Brothers and people like that, and boxers, some of the top boxers, as it calls and whatnot. They even got a statue of him up. Cincinnati has had so much talent that it's unbelievable. And it should be on the historical book, if not. And uh, in my movie, we're going to be doing some scenes uh, from Cincinnati. This movie, though, this is basically a biopic. This is like a, a movie based on your life, right? Oh, my whole life, I tell you. Mm. Uh, when I was seven years old, going on a hike, and uh, the traffic got real slow, stop and go, and the front part of the bus of the Cub Scouts looked over, and there was an activity going on, and then when they hollered out, oh, my God, you know, then the next row looked over and said, holy shit, you know, and by that time, the Scoutmaster got out where he can see, and he looked over. Holy shit, even louder. The Ku Klux Klan was hanging, two black guys, you know, and then they heard him and started running, chasing a bus, trying to get into our bus. The scoutmaster had to tell the bus driver to speed up, get us the hell out of here, you know, boom. And I'm seeing this at seven years of age, you know. Then we get back to the karate uh, workout session a day or two later. And I'm throwing everybody extra hard and throwing punches all hard. One of the guys looked up and says, uh, what's wrong with Vicky? Vicky trying to hurt us. He's throwing us so hard and punching us, hitting us so hard. And I says, well, I saw something the other day. I want to make sure it don't never happen to me. Mm -hmm. Bam, bam, start hitting them even harder, you know, taking them on. And uh, after graduation in high school, one of my students was a painter. He painted water tires, and we going down the road. And uh, we getting hungry, and I said, at the next restaurant, let's stop and eat. Yeah, yeah, man, I'm hungry too. Next restaurant we come up on, there's a big eight-foot burning cross outside. <laughs> well, you know, we're not going to eat here. I said, yes, we are. We're karate guys, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, but they, they may have guns, you know. So, he turned around, went on back. We get ready to go into this restaurant, which is sort of like a Cracker Barrel looking place with the wood plank and everything. The waitress come out, maitre d' lady, she comes out. Oh, yes, may I help you? Uh, yeah, we're coming to eat. Do you know where you at? Mm, yes, we're in Denton, Kentucky. Mm. 
No, 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 no. Do you know where you at here? Yes, we're at a restaurant. We want to go in and eat. Oh, I'm sorry, you can't go in. Uh, I had to get permission. She tipped down, went around to the back to look, and I kind of tipped behind her, and I'm peeping around the corner, and she's asking the owner, uh, probably saying is there this yeah, out there wanting to come in. And all these Klansmen was back there, evidently. You know, there's uh, some of them making the news. Some of them building the crosses and whatnot, you know. He shake his head, he, he come back around. I tip back over with my friend who was white, you know, with me. And he looked at us. And I heard him whisper to her, says, well, if the place enough to go in, let him go head on in. As long as he behaved himself. So he went on back. She said, well, whatever his name was, I forgot what his name was. Bob said, you can go on in. So where we go, she said, just go ahead on to the back and get a seat. On the way in, we look up on the wall. Dave, there's a whole roll of pictures of Ku Klux Klan's in uniform with the headpiece down. You can see their face. But up under there, let me tell you what was written up under there. Mm. Headquarters of the Ku Klux Klan's of Northern Kentucky. Wow. Man, we had to look at each other and says, are you sure we want to eat here? Here we are in the headquarters of the Ku Klux Klan's in Northern Kentucky. We sit down and we ate, but it was a rib place, you know, like Cracker Barrel. They brought them ribs out and set them down. I picked up one, looked at it, mailed it, took my tongue. She said, oh, it's good. If he said you can eat here, you can eat here. Hand me the rib. I'll, I'll eat it, you know. She took one of the ribs and didn't really buy it. I grabbed my arm. I said, okay, that's all right. Thank you. <laughs> I ate that rib, man, and we ate, and that was some of the best ribs. Now, everybody should know, us black folks, we can cook some ribs. Mm. We are grillers to the max, you know. But those ribs was the best ribs I ever had. Wow. Hey, I was telling that to one of my brothers, you know, and uh, he says, you know why those ribs were so good? I said, I don't know. I guess if they were smoked or the way they cooked them on the outside of the stuff. He says, no, the reason those ribs were so good is Y'all was eating black folks. The blacker, the better. <laughs> uh, he was just teasing with me, guilty, oh, yeah, you know. But it's, it's, it's of interest, you know. Then we got a, a plate to go. And we took that plate and went on down. Painting, and I ain't that crazy about height. No way, you know, the lighters tied on. and had to scoot around the water tire to be painting it, you know. And on the way home, I said, hey, we're going to stop at that restaurant. Uh-uh, no, we got to wait the first time, honey. They ain't going to be hanging me up with you, you know. And I said, no, 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 no. I said, come on, just stop. I, I'm not going to go in. I just got to do something. So we pulled the truck over. I jumped out, ran across the road, jumped up, and did my best flying sidekick. Bam! And knocked that big cross over. <laughs> got down. Ran back, got in that van, said, now let's get the hell out of Dodge. <laughs> man, trucks was following us all down 95, man. We were rolling, you know. Wow. So, you know, uh, I did a lot. And uh, Crooked Cops is going to be in my book. How cops used to come by nightclubs and uh, had to collect the money, pay them off. Uh, I used to bounce in different nightclubs and stuff. The owner come up to me, uh, Vic now. These officers are going to be coming in. Don't want you to do nothing. Don't say nothing. Uh, just, just leave them. Leave them go. Don't, don't do nothing. I say why? What do you mean? Uh, well, you know, it's payoff night. And that stuff is for real. You know, he said, oh, oh yes, that's how we even stay in business. Cops come in, walk on up to the office, soon, come out with a big bag full of money. Walk on out, get in that car and go. And I saw this three or four times personally myself, you know. One of the owners told me, uh, yes, that's how we stay in business. We got to pay off the cops. You know? and, uh, when I went to Cleveland, Ohio, uh, later on, one of my students, uh, Danny, hey, Danny, uh, he was running the school up there. And uh, it was uh, right in uh, outskirts of 
uh, Cleveland, and downtown was all the big uh, uh, businesses, apartments, and all. And one of the owners had a uh, detective agency. He would come down and take classes. He would let me go with him, finding missing persons and bail jumpers and all. Oh, man, I feel comfortable with you with me, Vic, you know. And all. Then he said, man, you need to become one of our officers. Let me uh, get you licensed and everything. Fill out these papers here and do this, you know, whatever. He got me bonded for $100,000, bond, got me a badge and everything. And now here he comes, he says, uh, you want one of these drop guns? I said, drop guns? I said, no. A lot of folks don't know what a drop gun is, you know, I'm going to tell you. He says, all officers carry these drop guns. And that's a little small gun that they have in their pocket. Mm -hmm. And he said, we'll see if we have to shoot one of you black folks. We just throw the gun down and say that, that you had a gun. And that's the reason we had to shoot you. Mm. I say, whoa. So that's what a drop gun is. He said, yeah, you I said, no, I ain't going to be shooting no black folks anyway. I don't want no drop gun. I got my karate. That's all I need, you know. Mm -hmm. So that's when I was educated to a drop gun, what a drop gun is. And to this day. A lot of them still carry drop guns. Crazy. Now, another good story is going to be in my autobiography is about the mafia. Down the street from the karate school used to be a pool hall. And one of the bouncers, uh, Larry, used to come down to the karate school. And couldn't nobody handle him but me. Mm -hmm. And he says, I want you to come and go with me to the pool hall because I have to bounce, bounce uh, protect the uh, mafia guys. When they go to shoot food, they shoot food for a thousand dollars a ball, you know. It's humongous money laying around on the table and inside. Well, being that I had my license and permit to carry my gun, I could go with him, you know, you know, bodyguarding the mafia when two or three of them is going down to shoot food. But we had to check our guns at the door instead of checking hats. You have to check the guns. So guns is coming out, rifles, you know, this and that. Because all the mafia is carrying guns, you know, I'll tell you about later. So um, we're there. Once in a while, somebody drank too much and they're ready to grab a handful of money. you got to grab them. you got to twist. you got to, you know, handle the situation and whatnot. That's why they like having me with them, you know, because I can handle the situation without have to pull out a gun, you know. Mm -hmm. Then we go back up to the club and he's telling them how I had to take care of the situation and whatnot. These mafia guys coming in every Tuesday and they pulling down the coat doing the mafia stuff. And I said, wow, I said, all these mafia guys do that stuff for real. So they go into the room to the office and they had a meeting, then they come out and leave. Once in a while, somebody have too much to drink and they're ready to tear up the place and they got a beer bottle and they smashing them. And I walk up to them and put my arm around their waist, hit the nerve centers with my fingers and I'm pressing in on those nerve centers. And they, oh, good. And I say, smile. And they got a smile and I say, now start walking. And I got them walking out and they, oh, good, you hurt me. You hurt. And I'm saying, smile, just walk them on out. Another time I may have to go up and put my hand up on that uh, uh, nerve right up under the uh, collarbone. And they go, oh, oh, come on, man, you kill me, you hurt me. I say, smile, smile. Now walk on out. So the owners of the club, they see and all this, and they say, man, what are you doing to these people? They'd be ready to tear up the place, and here they are, you walking them out, and they're smiling and carrying on. I say, well, yeah, it's just little nerves here and there, you know, whatnot. Oh, my God, this guy is something else. No wonder he's a world champion, you know, karate. And uh, one time this uh, young lady is sitting at the bar, a young girl, and uh, she's just in high school. And I says, uh, young lady, could you be sitting here at the bar? And I believe you got a drink there, haven't you? I said, uh, are you old enough to sit here? She said, nope. I said, well, 
young lady, I believe you're going to have to excuse yourself from this bar. You can't be sitting here. Well, I can sit anywhere I want. Mm -hmm. I said, just why is that? Well, see, my dad, he owns the place. <laughs> this is the monster daughter, you know? Yeah. And I said, you know, she kept trying to get close, and I move away, you know, and I, I would keep her at distance even though we would talk. This one day I go upstairs, and I'm going to eat upstairs, but I can't say what was upstairs because you'll know where I'm talking about, and that's private. Mm -hmm. uh, where I was sitting, one of the waitress didn't like it and said that I can't sit there and eat in this place, in this uh, situation. Larry said, well, uh, the owner said he can come up here and eat. Now, the only people that could go upstairs and eat in this place was the mafia people and rich white folk, rich, rich white folk. Mm -hmm. She told me I had to get up and leave. I said, well, the owner said I can. I don't care what he told you. You're going to have to leave, you know, from there. Larry said, the other bouncer says, you want me to go down there and tell so and so that he's not going to get served up here. I don't care where you go. You, he went down there and told the owner that she's not going to serve me. Or he came upstairs. Now everything goes still and move aside when the owner, you know, moves. He come up, sign. All the waitress are moving away. Sign. He says, "Did you get my message?" Uh, yes, sir. Well. When I give a message, just to be carried out, you're fired. Look what I need this job. I say, uh, you don't have a job no more. You know how they talk, you know, the month, you know, stuff. So he was fired right on the spot. Wow. He told me, you do a good job. You take care of our men. I like that. I like to see you don't even flirt with my daughter. <laughs> you know, I said, no, sir, no, sir. He says, you don't even hurt nobody here. We like how you operate. You can come up here and eat any time you want, and it's free. Nice. Wow, steak, shrimp, everything is free, man. Boom. So this one day, he uh, also called me to come in the office. Now, all these muffin guys coming in, Tuesdays, they got these coats on, and they, you know they're packing, you know. I said, in the office? I said, yeah. He said, you can go in there, go in the office, see what he want, man. Go. I said, but, but that's in the office, you know. I said, well, yeah, go ahead on in there. They go, world champion. Hey, you're getting kind of nervous now. They go in there. I go in there. Mr. Moore, you know why you here? I said, no, sir. No, sir. Uh, well, we had a vote, and we're voting into our family. You're going to become an honorary member of our family. Holy crap, man. All the championships I don't won, trophies I don't won. Wasn't nothing touching that, man. I, I about had tears in my eyes, you know, and stuff. He says, uh, your necktie, I always wore suit and tie, you know, you know. He says, undo your tie. I said, sir, undo your tie. And, I said, oh, now I'm getting nervous again. I said, what are they going to do? String me up, you know? So, and I, I get tied. He says, now this is the way we tie our tie. And he showed me the knot and the way they tie their tie. He said, now, anywhere you go, we're going to know who you are. If you ever need us, we're going to be there. Oh, my God. Wow. Ah, you're talking about, oh, thrill, son. That was a thrill of my life. Well, all this is going to be in my autobiography book. But there's a whole, whole lot more to all this. And then there's the bad side when I had to actually use karate. So, and I've been in life and death situations, but I'm still here. Yeah. Let me ask you this, Master Moore. Like, and somebody wanted me to ask you this because I had some people submit questions. What's your philosophy of martial arts and life in general? Oh, it's a way of life. It's to make you a better person. I'm a better person than what I would have been. And when I wasn't being so nice, it was because I had to. I was in life and death situations. Or I was protecting someone else. 
even though it may not have been me, but I have a right to protect a person that is lesser, weaker, you know, boom. Mm -hmm. I have a right to protect someone else's property when I so see fit, you know. Uh, I feel that I shouldn't be hit, taken advantage of. I shouldn't be hurt. And if I have to hurt someone else, it is because of that protection. It is learning to be more patient. It's learning to be more humble. It's, it's all of that good stuff, good stuff of human life. If the martial arts had a team and got started from crooks, bad people, it, will, it would have had a more bad tone to it. But because most of the founders of karate and the head instructors and teachers of karate was religious people. And therefore, karate has this more or less religious tone over on it. No, it's not a cult. No, we're not praying. We're down meditating as in peace of mind and clearing our mind. Mm -hmm. Yes, we concentrate. We're focusing because strength comes through concentration. Yes, we make noise and sound and stuff because that further strengthens our body, but it's all in good order. My instructor, instructors, poor, mm -hmm. was highly religious people. And they were wow. different religious sect, and they had different views, and therefore, when they talked and gave us our karate, it was more in a religious type setting, showing respect. Mm -hmm. We teach the ground of our karate school or wherever clean. When we come to class, pick up a piece of trash or pick something out in the street, uh, uh, stop smoking, don't throw cigarette butts down in front of the school taking our shoes off, coming in. Mm -hmm. Humbleness, showing discipline, keeping it clean. Your shoes are dirty. We don't come in with dirty shoes. Saluting, bowing. No, we're not bowing down in the religious aspect. We are saluting. Our Cub Scouts, we salute like this. Our Boy Scout, we salute like that. In the military, we salute like that. You show Humming. Respect, humble. Good evening, Sensei. Good afternoon, Master, or whatever the case may be. Showing respect. Not crossing in front of a black belt, walking behind. If karate was introduced from by hooligans, everybody would be coming in. Hey, you bunch of noise. Hey, high five, man. Yeah. Yeah, whoa, what you do last night? Oh, man, I had me a drink. I, I kicked this guy ass, you know. Blah, 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 blah. We're coming in just like you would go into a church. Mm -hmm. Respect, humbleness, softness. Kneel down, make a cross, or say a prayer, or whatever. That's, calm down, Vic. That's what karate is about. Humbleness, respect. But there comes a time that you can't always keep it, hold it. Mm -hmm. And that's where the karate creed goes. Empty hands, forgiveness to God, present myself to you humbly. Or I come to you with only karate. Empty hands, I have no weapons. But should I be forced to defend myself or my principles or my honor? Should it be a matter of life or death, right or wrong? Then I offer you my only weapons, my bare hands, karate. <laughs> you should have been gone. <laughs> That's what karate is about with me and should be with anyone else exactly let me ask you this grandmaster Moore. i know you're a karate traditionalist what do you think about mixed martial arts 
Are you a fan or not? Well, Joe Lewis and I started it back in 1969. We started that stuff. Karate was pretty much a mixed martial arts before there was a title mixed martial art matches. I got pictures to prove it. There's documentation to prove it. There's video to prove it. Okay. It is way out of hand, just like karate had gotten way out of hand. Master Triz even told us when we had the first match, he said, I don't want y'all to pursue this. I want y'all to stop. Mm -mm. It's too vicious. We started it, and it got softer and softer, and now it's way out of hand. What is mixed martial arts now? You don't see any martial art in this new mixed martial art. You don't see any Aikido. You don't see any Jiu-Jitsu. You don't see any Judo. You don't see any Karate much. Once in a while, you see a technique, not the art of it. You see more what we call street fighting. You just see more uh, gangster. You see more just fighting on the ground and kicking and swinging. There's no art to any of that. Go to the park and you can see two kids on the street or in the park kicking and grabbing and, and pulling hair and, and choking each other and whatnot. You don't see any art to it. Just like in this day, you don't see any art to karate. If I want to see a karate match, I want to see a karate match. And I know what karate is. It deals with stances and blocks and punches and strikes and kicks and all that in a certain order. Mm. I don't want to go to a karate match and they're doing ballet. They're doing gymnastics. They're doing street fighting, that's to say. Now, when we learn karate, we can use karate in any fashion that we want. If we want to use it for a tournament, we can. If we want to use it on the street, we can. We don't have to learn karate to fight. I would say all of us knew how to fight before we ever learned karate. Mm -hmm. You knew how to fight before you learned any martial arts. Oh, no, 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 no. Go to a bar and slap a guy and see, don't you know how to fight? <laughs> <laughs> Walk down the street and just hit a guy in the gut and see, don't you know how to fight? You know how to fight or run, one. <laughs> and if they catch you, you're going to be fighting. Mm -hmm. We knew karate, be uh, we knew how to fight before karate come along. But I said, by knowing karate, we can fight a little bit better. <laughs> yeah. But it's an art. And the artisticness of karate is those beautiful moves and techniques mm -hmm. the scientificness of karate is knowing the structure that we strike with like i was saying the bone alignment the side of the hand you know mm -hmm. the structure the bone structure you know that is the scientificness of karate breathing from the lower soccer time. The scientificness of karate. So there's two and three with the breath. The meditation to clear the mind, to stay relaxed. When we start a match, Joe Lewis and I, we're getting relaxed through breathing, breath control. Now we get into concentration. And when we strike, now it is breath control because your breath regulates the body movement. Oh, honey, honey, come here. Uh, uh, move this couch. Okay, honey, I'm going to move the couch. Ugh. Hey, Bob, come outside. Help me push this car out of, out of the... Uh, 
Got it. Got it. Oh, the push. Oh. Breathing sound gives you strength. You don't go and move the heavy object table, couch or whatever in the house and go, <gasps> inhale it. <gasps> you don't go outside and push the car, you know, and you go, <gasps> you focus in and you exhale in because when you exhale, it presses on the adrenaline gland and then the adrenaline gland gives you more energy and you get more strength and a weight lifter when he lifts the weight. <gasps> He's doing the same breathing. That's the scientificness of karate. And the beauty of the art is those beautiful moves like ballet. Oh, Vic, you don't like ballet just because they're doing these uh, uh, moves and stuff. I know a little about ballet. But when I go to a karate tournament, I don't want to see any ballet. Oh, Vic, you don't like gymnastics, they turning these flips and doing on and Kia! <laughs> oh, Vic, you just don't like them. Uh, wait a minute. I was on my gymnastic, gymnastic team, and we were all state. I love gymnastics, and I love ballet, even though I wasn't very good at it, but I was in two plays, the King and I, and Nuts Practice League. But when I go to a karate tournament, I don't want to see the Nutcracker Suite and, and, and anybody else. I want to see karate. So just because I'm strict on judging and I'm going to give you a low score unless I see real karate, and if I don't hear any breathing in your kata, except for... <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You can make all the noise you want. But if I don't see your breath right, you breathing right, and the kia correctly, kia, I'm giving you a low score. Oh, Vic Ma, he, he gave me a low score. He just, he just don't like gymnastics. He don't like ballet. He, 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 oh. Come talk to Vic Ma and he'll tell you why, and he'll show you why. I saw no stances, and you don't just get down and do a split and a backwards flip and key eye and think you're going to get a high score from me. That's not karate. You did some good gymnastics. What's that girl, that black girl that do them flips and stuff so good? What's her name? Anyway, you can put her in there and she does them flips and turn out of the air and do a twist and turn. And how about those swimmers, boy? They get up there. And they hit the board, and they dive, and they turn, and they spin, and they hit the water. Splash. Beautiful. Beautiful move. Mm -hmm. But it's not karate. Now, it can help them to do real karate technique and get down and throw good blocks and punches and all. But you got to separate it. Same way with MMA. MMA could be good fighting. And I would wish i would love to see more of the martial art and i remember uh who was that rousey wonder or rousey, yeah, her Ronda rousey. and she, she would go in and catch him around the waist and do that oh goshi that body throw and hang on to the arm and go down and do the arm bar break you know that hey good there there's some judo in there you know Boom. so there is a difference in just fighting and the martial art. It is a difference in boxing and wrestling. Now, you can combine the two if you want on the street. Mm -hmm. But if you're in the ring, you want to see wrestling, even though they make some strikes. But in boxing, it's a different art, it's a different sport. And that's the same way we have to look at karate. Karate is not just anything. Karate is an art and science. Mm -hmm. And the artisticness is one thing. And then there's the scientificness is a different thing. And if you don't have them, you're not doing karate. Well, everybody can kick, 
You can go to Las Vegas and see girls kicking. You can just go to an old folks home and see some old folks kicking their leg up. Now, just because they're kicking their legs does not mean that they're doing karate. Mm -hmm. And as I tell people, especially Taekwondo people, excuse me, <laughs> if you see a dog that just goes to a tree or a fence and raises his leg and take a piss, he's not doing Taekwondo just because he raises his leg up. Just because he goes and squat down, he's not doing a dance. It is the expertise and the showmanship that can separate these arts, you know. And if you don't have it, then you're not doing that art. You can't get out there and just jump in the water and say you're a swimmer, you, you're a professional. Why he give me a low score on my diving? Uh, I jumped in the water. <laughs> Let me ask you one more question, Master Grandmaster Moore. I, I know you offer telephone karate lessons. That's something you offer these days, right? Yes. For anyone in the audience who might be interested, can you tell them the benefit of getting your telephone karate lessons? Yes. Uh, I've been in the martial arts over 70 years. Just by itself doesn't make it. I've had 12 different styles of karate and teachers under my belt. Just that alone doesn't make it. It goes back to what Master Robert A. Tree said back in 1973, I mean 75. Vic Moore got a knack of teaching. He's one of the best teachers I have seen anywhere. It is not the style. It is not this technique or that technique over a person. When I give a seminar, I don't teach a person how to just make one punch or stop one punch. I don't teach a person or have a person just to block one kick and make uh, one technique. I give them a combination of techniques. So when I teach over the phone, when I got a person, I teach them principles and theory. If you're going to throw a punch, the punch is going to come to a certain spot on the body. We don't punch just straight out because if you punch just straight out, I'm telling the person, you're going to be hitting the person in the hard areas of the body, right at their chest level. And if the person turns to the side, where are you hitting? It's in the shoulder. And if you hit them in the back and you're punching straight out, you're hitting them in the upper shoulder. Am I right? So they listen and say, yeah. That's it. Now. If that punch is coming to the center of the body and it's punching down at the solar plexus, wherever you hit the person there, it's going to hurt in that area. If they on the side, you're going to hit them in the floating ribs, so it's going to hurt that way. Am I right? I said, now if the person you're punching has got their back to you, you're going to be punching down at an angle. You're going to be hitting them in the kidneys. Is that right? Oh, yes. I said, so now that's where you punch. Now, how you punch is lining your hand in a certain way of position by turning the knuckles out from, say, at 12 o'clock over to 1 or 2 o'clock. Now, put your hand up like that. Now, hit your hand with those two knuckles. You're going to see it's going to hurt a lot worse. Go ahead and hit it. Um, um, um. Oh, yeah, there is a difference in that. I'm going to say, now, as you punch, you want to be exhaling out. So I'm going through a whole cycle of theory mm -hmm. but even before we get into the physical i do tell them to learn to meditate to relax now we're going to meditate right here on the phone and i want you to block me out block everything out in there. or we're going to now punch pick a spot out in your house on your wall and i want you to focus i want you to try and push that spot away pretend that it is moving away from your body now make it come forward to take the door and look at the doorknob and make the doorknob come forth and go away. Oh, now you're going to do this kata, you know, later on and everything goes in steps. Now, you remember that downward block when your hand come up to your ear and it flows down at a 45 degree angle and it stops at a 45? That's what you're going to do in this kata when you turn and make this block. Now, you pivot on the heel when you go away. So if you're moving away, pivot on the heel. 
if you're moving toward the person, pivot on the ball. Well, they get, and they experience that. And you see that you learn more on the phone with me in five minutes than you work with somebody else in a year. Because you're going to be learning stuff that you never knew. When this person get ready to punch you, their shoulder is going to move first. So as you sparring, look at that guy's shoulder. Mm -hmm. And you're going to see his shoulder move. Now start expecting something that's coming at you. Now, if you're only one step away from him, all you got to do is take the palm of your hand and stop his shoulder. That's going to stop your arm because your shoulder have to move for your arm to move. Does that make sense? Oh, yes, sir. I see. I, I see what you're doing. Right. Is your wife available? Sir? Tell her the hug. You give you a hug. Now, you see how shoulders are moving first? For our arms to get in motion. Now, stop her from hugging you because just take both hands and press up the shoulder. Oh, now she can't even hug you. Well, that's the human body. Now, if you're two steps away and you can't reach that, catch the elbow. Stop the elbow. The elbow can stop the arm from moving. Now, if you're three steps, now you're going to have to block out. Now you got to know how to block. If you're four steps away, you don't have to do nothing. Why? Oh, because I'm out of range. That's right. So I give them theory, principle. If a person getting ready to kick, Bill Wallace getting ready to kick you, first thing you got to do is what? He got to shift his weight. Bill Wallace cannot kick nobody until he shifts the weight. He got to shift the weight to one leg. Mm -hmm. Well, if you only one step away, all you got to do is push him over, hit him right in the gut. Think. But you got to be fast because Bill Wallace is real fast. So the kick is up in the air coming at you. Catch the knee. If you stop Bill Wallace's knee, he can't kick you. He can't throw a front kick, side kick, back kick, roundhouse kick, peanut butter and jelly kick. He can't do no kick if you control the knee. That's why I beat him. Hey. Now, if you're three steps away, then you got to block out. Mm -hmm. If you're four steps away, then you don't have to worry about it because you're out of range. Mm -hmm. So you play the distance on the person. So I'm not there with the person, but the person can understand exactly what I'm saying. And I mm. yeah. says, now, if you had a, a stick, a bow stick or a broom, and you put it across the person's leg at a 45 degree angle out from your body. Now, you can't have it up against your body. Take the broom and you hold that broom out from, their, uh, from your body across their legs. You stop their kick. They can't kick you. They got to try and kick up over the broom or uh, under the broom. And with at that 45 degree angle out, they can't do either one of them. Mm -hmm. Oh, I see what you're saying. So again, it's theory. They learn in theory, you know? Yeah. So <clears throat> that's the advantage of having a good instructor, a person that can teach you the theory of a technique, mm -hmm. breathing. Meditation, concentration, focusing, snapping. When you throw this punch, snap the punch like a whip. I can take a whip and throw it or rope and hit you with it, and you may sting you. You may say, ouch, ooh, Vic, that, that rope hurt. But if I pop it, pow, if I snap it, boom, go out and back real quick. Oh, oh touch it too. Oh, my God. It really hurts. Well, that's the way your karate punches work. That's the way your chops work. It goes out and it comes back quickly. So that's that's why the people can learn more or just as much with me. To work with a person that's been in karate for over 70 years, to work with a person that has defeated every national champion out there that I've fought. Hey, that's somebody to work with. You know? Definitely. But Sanson is good too. So a lot of them is good. If they wasn't good, I wouldn't be fighting them. <laughs> hey guys, thanks very much for watching the full video. Make sure to check out that Patreon, like I mentioned, link it in the description below. Some of the exclusive content there is I'm going to give some of my thoughts after the fact from these interviews and also give you some behind the scenes on how I even got a hold with these different individuals such as Grandmaster Victor Moore.